came into town. Um, and David, Homer, and I have been friends for decades, and I think that just goes to reveal the wonderful grace of God that he would stay my friend for all this time. And uh, David uh, grew up in Taiwan. His uh, parents were missionaries in Taiwan, and he's going to share the story with you. Uh, we, we met in Hong Kong, I don't know, a long time ago, and uh, in our many decades of missionary service together, uh, we became good friends. Um, he, he's in town, and I asked him, I said, would you come and, and just tell us about your ministry so that people can know and uh, share with us? And so I'm so grateful that you would come and spend this day with us, David, and come, and I, I know you're going to be a blessing to us. grateful for the opportunity to be here to uh, see my good friend Tim again. And, uh, we met in Hong Kong, but we also met in Vietnam. Kind of world travelers, you know. <laughs> and uh, now back here in Texas, of all places. So, really glad to uh, be able to be a part of uh, Faith Bible Church here, too, and to see how God is working and blessing in your midst. I'm a missionary kid, born and raised on the mission field. And um, just decided I liked it enough to stay there. But uh, I'm, the reason I'm in San Antonio is because um, I, I make a, an annual trek to the United States here. And because my mother, who is 86 years old, has her birthday next week. And uh, since I'm the number one son, I feel like I need to come by and, and to uh, make sure she's okay. She must still lives by herself in Florida there. I also have a daughter who lives in San Antonio. She has a few grandkids. And another son who lives in Sarasota, Florida. So he has got a couple of grandkids. And then another son that lives out in California. He's got uh, three grandkids. So I, you know, I got to make the rounds, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, my daughter Mindy and her husband Jared are back in the back there. I, yes. And they brought two grandkids with them. They're out with Grandma, which is always nice having Grandma around, I guess. So, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, our background. Uh, my parents went to Taiwan back in the early 50s. My father is a graduate of Moody Bible Institute. He went there because a missionary from China visited his uh, farm church in uh, Brown City, Michigan, and challenged him about uh, going to China as a missionary. And so he went down to Moody Bible Institute in preparation for that. parents where he met uh, a young lady by the name of Mary. And they were married and on their way to Taiwan. On their way to Taiwan, they went through a typhoon. This, and then you have to understand now, back in those days, these missionaries went off at a very young age. My mother was 22 and my dad was 24. And that, to me, just seems incredibly young. Uh, you agree? Yeah. <laughs> the older I get, the younger it seems. <laughs> so, uh, on the way there, they went through a typhoon, and, and Taiwan was rebuilding at that time, and they were buying steel from the U.S., and there was these steel I-beams on the ship, and a, a chain had broken, and as the ship moved to one side, the I-beams would sway off over the water, and then it goes the other way, and it comes slamming back, and the sailors would try to get a chain around it again, and then jump off before it takes off, and anyway, the captain told them that if one of those I-beams had happened to have fallen off, they would have sashayed into the water, come right back, and pierced the boat, and they would have gone down, and so that was uh, their introduction to life on the mission field. Uh, I stowed away. I was uh, in my mother's womb at the time. And as soon as they got to Taiwan, I was born in a hospital there. One of the very few foreign babies born in the hospital. And the reason I have uh, the cheeks that I do is because the nurses kept pinching, pinching my cheeks. And I couldn't believe that the babies had cheeks like those. But <clears throat> soon afterwards, then my parents moved down to the city of Jiayi, which is a city in the southern part of Taiwan that um, um, in Taiwan at that time, there was an emphasis on promoting Mandarin speaking, but the local dialect, the Taiwanese dialect, was um, one that was not very 
it was frowned on by government. But my dad studied that because that was what the, the, the locals speak. And as a kid growing up, uh, I spoke Taiwanese uh, at the same time I was speaking English. I was much more comfortable in Taiwanese because that's what my friends were speaking. And, and uh, at the church there, I grew up uh, in a bamboo church. He was baptized uh, early on as a young child. But uh, my dad went there to plant the church, came back to the States after five years for a furlough, went back to Taiwan for their second term. There built uh, an auditorium, that, which still stands today, and then returned to the U.S. for his second uh, furlough, and then came back to Taiwan and, and for, to begin their third term there. His idea was that he would begin a, a uh, village ministry, and uh, he would take, uh, he bought one of those first Ford Econoline vans that had just come out, and he would take this van, load it up, go out to the village, and have a preaching station where they would preach night after night after night until a group of believers came together and that was how they would establish a church and then they would begin to nurture this church while they went on to uh, another place and established a couple like that. Well, he was coming back home uh, late one night from one of these evangelistic services and uh, a truck was broken down the road and no lights on, no warning. He was blinded by oncoming lights and ran into the back of the truck and was killed instantly. Um, 34 years old, young man, five children, left behind, and, and uh, my mother, uh, she had her, she herself had experienced a call to go to China. She actually went to China, not because of her husband, but she would say in spite of her husband. And when they were dating, uh, my dad said, uh, I think God's called me to China. She told him, she said, Leland, I'll have you know that most men never make it to the mission field. And if you think marrying me is going to get you there, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so uh, my mom had this very deep sense of a call to China, to the mission field also. And so after uh, her husband passed away, then she, she stayed. And uh, I was the oldest. I was 10 years old. I had a sister who was eight, another sister six, a brother four, and the youngest brother was uh, two years old. And, and uh, she said, God called me, so she raised us there on the mission field. It was not without some uh, difficulty, to be sure. You know, again, I, I, I don't say this with any bitterness or any being critical at all, but uh, all of our supporting churches back in the States dropped our support because typically women don't go to the mission field and certainly you don't have five children with you on the mission field. And it was expected that she would come back to the States, but she knew God's calling upon her. So uh, by using Social Security and also working in a missionary school, she was able to stay on the mission field, stay involved with uh, Chinese ministries, and that's where I was raised. I went to a missionary school, graduated in uh, 1970, and Typically, when you finish high school overseas someplace, then you're going to come back to the United States and, and continue your studies here. So, I came back to America. I remember, uh, you know, my mom, this is, this is, uh, this is kind of the, the role that, the way that it used to be. It's not so much that way now with families, but they, my mom put me on the airplane, sent me back to the U.S., and I landed at Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, I had no clue what to do. I had an aunt I was supposed to, to meet up with there. And all I knew was, hey, where I come from, you just get in a taxi and go. And I had no idea where she lived. She could have been in Las Vegas for all I knew. But as it turned out, I had a local address, and the cab driver dropped me off there. And uh, this was my introduction to America. I, I honestly, I felt just uh, like a fish out of water. I didn't, uh, um, we never even had television until I was a senior in high school. Now, some of you might understand that. But uh, I know TV's been a long time around in this country, but not in my country. And, and so I didn't know, I didn't know the lingo, I didn't know the TV, I didn't know anything. And here I am back in this country, and I thought it said missionary kid across my forehead. And I, I just was very uncomfortable for me. One thing I could do was to play soccer, because that's what we did there. And, and um, it was a beginning sport here, so I was pretty good at it. I got me in, though, with the wrong crowd, and so uh, I... I just didn't have uh, any time for church or, or Christianity and that kind of stuff. And I wrote a letter back to my mom and said, Dear Mom, I no longer am a Christian. I don't believe in this stuff anymore. I don't think 
I don't believe in Jesus anymore, and uh, I just don't want any of the rules and regulations, and uh, sent it off to mom in Taiwan. It was rough. It was rough. Uh, she, uh, I, I, I can say this, that I stand here as a preacher today because my mom kept praying for God to, uh, to uh, bring her son back. <coughs> when my dad died, God gave her two promises. One is, I will, be, uh, I will take care of the widow, and I will be a father to the fatherless. And God uh, kept his promise, and my mom kept God to his promise through her prayers. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, it was uh, a difficult journey. Uh, I just never felt <clears throat> acclimated in the United States. And one of the reasons why I married the girl that I married is because since she was a little girl, she always wanted to be a teacher of missionary kids. And since I never had any inclination whatsoever to live in America, I was always going to go back. She kind of latched on to me, and uh, we went back to Taiwan. We actually went to Hong Kong instead of going to Taiwan, where little did she know she was going to be homeschooling her six children while we were in Hong Kong. And uh, we were there in church planting in Hong Kong for about 15 years, <coughs> where um, we took Anthony and Mindy uh, over with us to Hong Kong, and then four more were made in Hong Kong. <laughs> if you look back here, you see the label, it says, made in Hong Kong. <laughs> they grew up in the Chinese schools and so forth. I, after being in Hong Kong for about 15 years, though, I, I really sensed that um, the the local leadership was not going to step up and take, take, uh, take the reins. Uh, again, you know, it's 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 kind of the Asian way. I I came over and started the churches, and 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 we had this group and fellowship of pastors. But I was always in Chinese. We'd say, uh, "Lao Ban," uh, I was the boss, and uh, so they weren't going to step out and do anything without first clearing it with me. And that's just not that wasn't going to work. So after about 15 years there. Uh, we decided that we're going to head back to the States and see where God was going to move us next. About that time, there was a group of Chinese that were wanting to start a church in the Oakland Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area in Oakland. And they contacted me to see if I'd be interested to work with them. And we talked and chatted for a while. And this was a group of uh, American-born Chinese, ABCs, who um, had wanted to, to have their own uh, church there, but they were looking for somebody who would pastor them, who understood them. Well, I did, I kind of understood them, you know, having been raised pretty much in the Orient. We, we did have a bit of a problem, though, in that I looked at them, and, and they looked so Chinese to me, I expected that they were going to look and act like Chinese. They looked at me, and they said they didn't see Chinese in me at all. They thought I would be ex acting like the Americans do. Well, as it turned out, I was the Chinese, and they were the Americans. And uh, we'd, go, we'd go visiting, and I'm going visiting with this Chinese guy with me, and he looks at me to translate for him. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Uh, so we, we had a bit of a problem. Once we got that settled out as to who's who, then we, we were fine after that. But after five years there, I made a commitment to, to work five years to get the church established. And again, God did a great thing. The church was well established. We're able to get property, and, and uh, now they're up around, let's see, four or five hundred they're running in their congregation now. And, but after five years, I just, uh, I was having a hard time. I, I'd, I'd walk outside my house, and I'd look up and down the block there, and I'm thinking, oh, my soul, they, what are you doing here? It, and, and I just, uh, I, I love America. I'm very glad to be an American. I think the best thing I have besides my Bible is my U.S. passport. But I'm not made to live here. I'm honestly not made to live here. And uh, I come over and visit America, but I, I can't see myself living here. Um, and no offense, folks, but, but uh, you know, I just, I feel so comfortable and so at ease in, in Taiwan. So after five years at that church there in the Bay Area Heritage Baptist Church, uh, in June or July of 2004, I resigned the church and we went back to Taiwan, which is my uh, jia. It's my old home, and uh, so glad to get back to Taiwan. Expected to be 
involved in um, a Chinese ministry because, I mean, I speak Chinese. And I, I know how difficult it is to learn the language and how many missionaries never, they just never get to learn it because it's a very difficult language. It's a tonal language. And uh, Pastor Ekno understands this. Oh, I got to tell you a little story about Pastor Ekno. This is very sorry. Uh, I went to visit him and, and uh, we went to Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And so uh, I was with a couple of other uh, pastor friends, missionary friends, and, and uh, we went and stayed at a Thai hotel run by some folks from Thailand. And we went in there, he, he was checking us in, and there was, this, there was this girl behind the desk, and she was being really snippy. I don't know what it was about it, but then she started rattling off stuff in Thai. And, and Pastor Ekno right, came right back at her in perfect Thai, and she just... <laughs> yeah, she cringed and walked right away. So that's just a lesson. Don't ever assume that somebody doesn't understand the language you're speaking. And every missionary has all kinds of stories about, uh, yeah, how people assume that they don't understand what you're talking about. Anyway, so, um, where was I? Get, yeah, getting ready to go back to Taiwan. And uh, I speak Chinese, and so I expected to have a Chinese ministry. But there was a, what, what's, it's, what's interesting has happened there is that, uh, and happened over many years, and we're seeing this now, there's a large Chinese population in this country because they're going to our universities. There's also a very large population of Chinese in Germany who are attending German universities for engineering and music. And so, um, this, this population that has come from Taiwan now, what we're seeing happen as the economy um, weakens or is weak, then they go back to Taiwan because they have some enormous opportunities there uh, because they're bilingual and they can oftentimes get jobs in American corporations that are doing work. But when they go back to Taiwan, they don't really fit uh, because they spent enough time here, and then oftentimes they'll, uh, many, on many occasions, they'll become a believer here, get married, have children here in the States, then head back to Taiwan, and their children are not Chinese speakers. Their children are much more comfortable in English. And so they'll, they'll put them into the international school, but then when they go to church, then mom and dad want to go back to the Chinese church, and the kids just don't get it. Just don't get it. So we've got these mixed families, and this is where then uh, there was this group that was meeting there, and they asked me to come and preach for them, just because they had different preachers every week and didn't really have a pastor. And so they said, actually, one of my sons said, uh, well, my dad's not doing anything. Why don't you just ask him? So, <laughs> so I went and preached for them, and they said, well, we want you to be our pastor. I said, no, 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 I, I don't want to do this. As you see, I speak Chinese. Why would I want to come and have an English ministry? But I, I met with some of them, and um, uh, a group of the, the uh, leaders in the church there, we were having this conversation, and one of them looked at me and he says, you know what, Dave, he says, you're just like we are. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I was born in Taiwan, and you were born in Taiwan. And we left the U.S. to get our education, and you left the U.S. to get your education. And he said, now we're all back in Taiwan, and you're back in Taiwan. You're just like we are. And oh, that just really, that really hit me hard. I mean, God, God took that and, and really spoke to me that there's a, a larger and a growing population of people then who uh, have come back to Taiwan, but they're bicultural, they're English speaking. So we, we have an English speaking local church. Uh, we don't call it an international church. We call it a local, a, an English-speaking local church. We have our population is probably half and half uh, between ethnic Chinese and, and expats. But even amongst the expatriate uh, group, many of them are um, missionary kids who have also come back to Taiwan, like myself, and have ministries there. So uh, it's it's just really been a very good fit. It's all it's just been such a uh, a blessing. And all of my ministry, I've been a church planter, where I've gone someplace and planted a church and turned it over to somebody, and, and uh, I, I still go back to visit in, in uh, Hong Kong every now and then to the church there, and, and then the one also in the, in the Bay Area. 
Uh, and, and this church, I decided this was going to be the last one. So we've been there about, uh, I think it's uh, eight years or so. We started with uh, about 30, and, and this past Easter we had 301. And we've started two services because uh, our, our, really our uh, auditorium is not much different than yours here. And we, we had people standing up. We put screens all over the place. And we put coffee tables out there so they'd go out there and leave this in here open so for people to come in. But we couldn't do two services on Sunday because we share with a Chinese congregation. So we start at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Now, if you, it's a little bit different. In the big cities, nothing happens till 10.30 in the morning. I mean, it's basically dead till 10.30. We start at 9 a.m. That means in order for them to get to our service, they oftentimes have to, get to be leaving home between 7.30 and 8 o'clock just to get to our, our service. So I knew that we weren't going to start an earlier service, and we couldn't do a later service, so we decided to do Saturday night. And Saturday night has really taken off. Um, it's been really a blessing. Started out to about 40 or so, and uh, my wife told me we had well over 50 yesterday, or this past Saturday. But the... the, the uh, the joy of it is, this past Easter, we baptized five, and uh, one of the, uh, a, a couple that we baptized was from our Saturday night service. They can't come on Sundays. So somebody said, well, hey, you can't come on Sundays, come to the Saturday night service. And they began to come. She was from a Catholic background. He had no church, no religion background at all. <coughs> And he tells his testimony about how God was just really working on him. And they came to me and they said, Pastor, we need to, we need to be baptized. And so we went through the whole thing to be sure we were all on the right track. And, and, and uh, they made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and were baptized. The reason I say that is because uh, that's, that's what the ministry is all about. You know, I, that's, what, what we, that's what we do in Taiwan. That's what you do here. And... and uh, we, and that's what you're going to do after church again today is, is have a baptism. And I, I really get stoked. I know a lot of churches like to measure their growth by how many got saved. To me, uh, I like to measure the growth by how many are willing to take uh, the step into the baptismal waters and make a statement of their faith in Jesus Christ through baptism. That's just incredibly exciting to me. But uh, in the... In, this past Easter, again, you know, I've been in the ministry 30 plus years now, and, and uh, it just, I, I, I'm grateful actually. I'm grateful that things that can be so mundane, suddenly the lights go on, and you go, wow, I never realized this was so exciting. And one of those things was the verse that we call the Great Commission, uh, Matthew chapter 28. And uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses. Uh, 18, 19, and 20, in there, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How many times do we look at this verse? I mean, I'm a missionary, for crying out loud. And, uh, and, and this is the Great Commission. This is what sends us all out. But it suddenly struck me that it says in there that we're to make disciples and do what? So I was thinking, well, making disciples, baptizing, and teaching. But I, my question was, why baptizing? What, why did Jesus specifically said there that we're to not only make disciples, but we're to baptize them? And uh, because, uh, you know, I, we do, but... I guess it's a bad habit. I'm always asking why. And it's part of my rebellious teenager that never never left me. And I'm always asking why. And then so the question was, what, why, why put the baptism in there? And this past Easter, it just really struck me hard how incredibly important it is that um, baptism is there. You, you see, when a person... When a person receives Jesus Christ, it's a matter that's done by faith. And I can't see your hearts, you can't see my heart. But Jesus, amazingly, gave to us a method whereby we may physically reenact how 
we are saved. So that we can copy Jesus in the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and, and uh, in what we call baptism. So why do we have this baptism then? The reason that we have baptism is because it marks us. It marks us. Baptism does not save us, but it puts a mark on us that identifies us. I wear a mark on my hand here. It's a wedding ring. And uh, this wedding ring is a mark that uh, I've made a commitment to my wife and is telling the whole world, this is a sign that I'm a married man. Now, I can take this off, and I'm still a married man, right? Uh, but I... I I proudly wear it because it identifies me then as being Candy's husband. And so we as Christians also have this opportunity then where we can uh, take on the mark of Jesus Christ in his resurrection. Here's my experience though, is that oftentimes as Christians, we, we, we make it to the cross. And thank God for the cross. And, and, and the mark of our Christianity, the identity of our Christianity is oftentimes the cross. And, and again, uh, we oftentimes talk about how we die to sin, uh, we die to the old life, but that's not where it stops. For us as Christians, it's not so much about dying if there's not a resurrection. You see what I'm saying? Is that, so okay, we've, we've died to this, and we've died to that, we've died to the old habits, and we've died to the old way, and the old life, and, and so forth, but too many of us are so busy dying that we don't really understand that there's a life to be lived, and that's where the resurrection comes in. And, and, uh, and we have been blessed by giving us this way where we can reenact, as we're going to see in just a bit, coming back up out of that water as a, a picture then of that resurrection, that new life, that new way of living. And so why do we have this baptism? It's a wonderful thing. I, I want to be very, very clear to you today in saying that we're not saved by the water, we're saved by the blood, but we have the blessed privilege of making it very public for everyone to see, I am now identified with Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and his resurrection, and the new life that he gives to me. It has a huge impact on us as to what this resurrection means and how come it's so important. That, and to understand then that it's a bodily resurrection. You, you see, uh, when Paul was speaking to the church in Corinth, that church was having some problems. One of the problems that church was having was they had some doubts as to whether or not there was a resurrection. Honestly, I'd be the first one to admit, me too. Me too. Uh, my dad died, and my dad is dead, dead, dead. I have no expectations that my dad's coming back in this life. You know, there's a finality to death. It just, and it's very difficult to accept at times. Very difficult to, to live through the just, it's a certainty. And yet, and yet, as we sit here today, and as we celebrated last Sunday, and we celebrate this Sunday, and next Sunday, and the next, we're celebrating the fact that we say a man died on a cross, was put in a grave, and he rose again. I understand. Well, Jesus is God. Yeah, okay. So, so that makes it make, okay. No, the point is, Jesus came as a human, and he is God-man, and man who is God, and I don't understand that, but we cannot get away from the fact that he is human through and through, and Jesus died. And what we're saying today is, he rose again from the dead. I, I have an interesting um, story, I guess, about changing attitudes amongst Christians. This, this man was talking about attending Christian funerals. And at Christian funerals, he hears these terms such as having gone into the presence of the Lord, or they might say, and they've entered into glory, or enjoying the splendors of heaven, and so on. But we've gotten away from the phrase, the resurrection of the dead. And that is a fundamental cardinal doctrine that we as Christians believe in, the resurrection of the dead. 
You don't have a hard time with that? Now, you go to work or you go to the coffee shop or you go talk to some of your unbelieving friends and you tell them, hey, listen, let me tell you about a friend who died and now he's alive. And they're going to look at you like, are you kidding me? So I, I say that to say this. <coughs> We can get caught up in our community here. We can get caught up in our doctrines and our faith and our theology and all of this and, and, and believe these things because it becomes so passe. We hear it day to day and all the time and, and believe it through and through. But sometimes we don't stop and consider like what it is we believe. And we are saying that a man died, was buried for three days and he busted out of the grave and we praise God that he did and every Sunday we sing songs and glory to God, we serve a risen Savior. <coughs> that should be life-changing for us. The problem is this. There seems to be a disbelief in the bodily resurrection. And this is what Paul was dealing with in the, in the church of Corinth. <laughs> that there was a certain group of people who had a, a difficulty believing it. And, and, and the reason I bring it, bring it up is this. Would you agree with me that in the society, in the culture in which we live, the idea of the resurrection is for? It's not accepted. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, well, I can tell you where I come from in Taiwan. It's uh, in, in a pagan world. I, I, I understand when people have, when they choke on this resurrection thing, because they all believe that people died. Let me, let me tell you, uh, in Hong Kong, there's uh, on Lantau Island, on the highest mountain of Lantau Island, which is where the airport is, if you've ever flown into Hong Kong, there's a great big fat Buddha. I mean, he's one of the largest in Asia. And the reason that that's, uh, and, and I, I'm not, I, excuse me, I'm not being disrespectful when I'm saying he's a great big fat Buddha. That's actually a, a sign of blessing. You wouldn't want a skinny one. You would want a fat one because that means they're well off and they're good and, and they're kind and they're considerate. So, uh, but here's the thing. The reason that there's a, a train of tourists going to see this Buddha is because they have a relic. It's about the size of a grain of rice. And it's an actual piece of or a bone from Buddha's body. And the people file by to look at this little relic of dead Buddha. Now, hello, hello, is anybody, we are going to go and worship this dead Buddha as if someone who's dead is going to help us? But you see, they don't believe in a physical resurrection, they believe in a spiritual resurrection. This is where we fundamentally differ from every other religion in the world, in that we believe in a physical bodily resurrection. And that's a, that's a game changer, folks. That's a game changer. We don't believe that Jesus had some spiritual resurrection. We believe Jesus rose again from the grave bodily, and because he did, we will. Because he did, we will. And so, this then gives us this hope. It also gives us a message that we can give, give to others. People, um, I have these conversations and people say, well, I'm not sure I believe in Jesus. And I'll ask them why, and they go, well, I'm not sure that he's a real person. And it's like, really? Have you seen Buddha? Have you seen Confucius? And we don't have any questions. And, and did you know there's more historical fact on, on Alexander the Great than there is on Jesus? And we don't have any questions about that, do we? So, so the fact is, is that it's a historical fact that a guy named Jesus was nailed to a cross. We also know that, in, according to Roman records, he was put into a grave, and there were guards assigned to that grave. And we also know today the grave is empty. These are three things that we can, we can depend on. When Paul is talking about <coughs> resurrection to the church in Corinth, he also mentions then that there were several people who saw Jesus. <coughs> that has got to be a very frightening experience. Honestly, the guy walks through the door and into your presence, and you're not blown away. I, I don't know. I, I just don't think if we as Christians really stop to think about this, you know, as to, to, to as. But I would be totally blown away. And uh, maybe, maybe I'm anyway. So, so um, Jesus raises 
from the grave. And, and uh, Paul then mentions the fact that he also saw Jesus after his time. And if you go to Paul's testimony in the book of Acts, here's what Paul says. Three times he gives his testimony. Three times he talks about meeting with Jesus Christ. And he is an apostle because Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul. He was a man who despised the Christians. He was trying to annihilate them and destroy the sect of Christians because they were taking away from his own Jewish community, his Jewish religion. He met Jesus face to face, the real Jesus who rose again from the grave, and it changed his life. And I want to say to you this, folks. If, we're, if our life is not changed through encountering Jesus, we have not encountered Jesus. You cannot encounter Jesus and not have your life changed because he was dead and he's alive. That's the resurrection. And that's why it's such an important message. And that's why we have baptism because that's the picture that identifies us as a people who have been born again, raised again to a new life. And so we need to ask ourselves then, okay, why baptism? Why the resurrection? But we need to also ask ourselves this. What effect does that have on me? Has the resurrection affected me? And I pray that it has. Because if there's no resurrection, and this is the question that Paul brings to them. He says, if there is no resurrection, consider this. What about your sin? If there's no resurrection... He's still pinned it. I mean, it, it didn't, this cross doesn't do anything for us, right? If there's no resurrection, we still live in our sin, we still bear our sin, and it's all on us. There's no one else to put it on. So we have no salvation, we have no hope. If there's no resurrection, folks, we are a very miserable people, just like all of our friends and colleagues who do not know Jesus Christ and have not embraced the resurrection. So for us then, we have to understand that the resurrection shows to us that death and sin have been destroyed. Have been destroyed. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul makes that very, that he makes that so very clear. Death and sin are destroyed. I, in my younger years, I never thought too much about dying. And if you hear some of the stories, you'll realize he never thought too much about dying. <laughs> yeah, for somehow or another, that kind of passed on to my children. So I have these heart palpitations all the time because my children never think about dying either. But uh, as the years progress, yeah, and I get closer to that end than to the other end, uh, I start thinking about it, and I'm going, you know, what are you going to leave behind, and all this kind of thing, because death is a very real thing. Ah, for me, because of the resurrection, it's a passing thing. It's a passing thing. So for me, as a Christian, I can look death in the eye, and I can say, all things shall pass. Because we live today, beginning today, because of the resurrection, we live eternal life. It's not eternal life, pie in the sky, bye bye. Because of the resurrection, we begin now to live eternal life. So think about it, folks. What if there is no resurrection? Then you then it's such a tragedy to, to stand beside the bed of someone who's breathing their last, who has no hope of what's to come, who has no, nothing else to, to look forward to. And so that's why we have a message. As unbelievable as it is, our message is of someone who came to this earth, he died, and he rose again. Paul makes this correlation very, very clear. If you look in Romans chapter 6, you'll see how this, this resurrection and our baptism and a picture of it is... Um, graphically clear. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, and we'll begin reading from uh, verse 1. 
He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that, get this, bapti baptized with him into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Really? For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Too often we stop there. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, this is where we need to be, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So, amen, amen, amen. That's the message. That's why it was so exciting this past Easter to see this couple. She's from Malaysia, he's from Singapore, and they're Chinese Malaysia, Chinese Malaysia. And, and then to, to see these others who were baptized and experience that. And, and, and I went all the way to Taiwan and to Hong Kong to, to see these people reenact that. Uh, what I want to say to you is this. Faith Bible Church, you're missionaries too. That commission that says that we're to go and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that wasn't just given to me who goes overseas somewhere else. That was given to all of us. That means we all have a mission field. We all have someone close to us whom we need to share the message of the resurrection. And we need to share the message of the resurrection and the new life in Jesus like we really do mean it. Not just believe it. Oh yeah, I know. That's what the Bible says. No, no, no. We really mean it. Because the life that we now live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us and he rose again from the dead that we might have that life. It needs to be, I, I'm telling you, I, I don't know who's getting baptized today, but it should be a life-changing experience as it marks us and sets us apart as the child of God to promote and to give the message comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dead to sin, alive to Christ. Wow. That's worth dying for, isn't it? Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this very simple enactment in which we can, you, you, you allow us to show this testimony again of how you died for us, you were buried for us, you rose out of the grave for us, and we, we experience that in our baptism. We step out by faith, we're marked by our baptism. Mark us profoundly, and let it be such an important part of our life as we share it with others. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage us as you send each one of us out into this world, to our mission field, Lord, that we would, we would walk in the new life that's been given to us through our risen Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.